Today's talk is about past attempts to steer society towards stability and what you can learn from these attempts. The problem of taming the complexity of nature through technological and social structures is as old as humanity itself. And in the past century, we've seen technocrats from the biggest countries in the world use the language of computing to craft a more bountiful and stable future. Keith and I believe that we have much to learn from a lot of the successes and the mistakes from this history. Today's story begins right after World War II, where a professor at MIT believed that he had conjured a new technology whose forms could help us forge a better world. That professor is named Norbert Wiener. Norbert invented the field of cybernetics, the study of self-regulating mechanisms that had just set the world on fire. Alongside his three best friends, he was working to fully realize his cybernetic vision. Cybernetics is a mysterious sounding word, which is perhaps part of why it caught on so quickly. Wiener drew from the, the Greek Kubernetes for steersmen. He was concerned with systems that rely upon feedback in order to decide what to do next. Since antiquity, we've created systems that rely upon feedback mechanisms. The sailor and a ship work in tandem to steer through chaotic waters. And if the sailor feels a swell of wind pushing the boat off course, he or she will steer accordingly. Each twist of the rudder is a reaction to the ocean and to the world in general. And it's an attempt to harness these forces of nature for human ends. Wiener was also inspired by the beautiful mechanical feedback systems of the Industrial Revolution. And by the year 1800, James Watt's rotating governor device could automatically regulate the speed of a steam engine. The faster the internal centrifuge whirled around, the more it ascended on its axis, the more it closed up the engine's throttle valve. During World War II, Wiener used the governor's principles to develop anti-aircraft machine guns that could automatically track and shoot down enemy airplanes. Through this research, he had discovered the mathematics of control and information theory. And he envisioned how he could describe all of these systems that involve feedback, not just steam engines and machine guns. But first, I want to hand it off to my friend Keith. We'll tell you a little bit more. Thank you, Luke. So this all brings us to MIT's Building 20, the building that was demolished to make room for Stata in this very auditorium. It was in that building in the year 1951 that Wiener assembled a gang of odd and eccentric researchers. These were like-minded and dependable people who all felt that by rigorously defining feedback loops and control systems, you can learn how to steer countless, countless complex systems. Wiener was beginning to create his new cybernetic society here at MIT. He had recruited Walter Pitts, a troubled prodigy who ran away from his broken home at the age of 15 to study logic at the University of Chicago. Warren McCulloch, a neurophysiologist who dropped his tenured professorship at the University of Illinois to work under Wiener as a researcher. And finally, Jerome Letvin, a father of modern, modern neuroscience who would go on to become the head of house of the fabled Bexley Hall here at MIT. McCulloch and Pitts were already superstars. They had previously created the first neural network in 1943 and had demonstrated that the human brain could be modeled as a digital computer. They, adv they advanced the idea that humans, as complex as we believe we are, we are machines, cybernetic machines. Their work would go on to set the foundations and inspire those who went on to found the, the field of artificial intelligence. I've kept the personal details of these men short, but I encourage you all to read more about them. They are truly inspiring figures. All these men were drawn to MIT by Wiener's 1948 book, Cybernetics. It was a massive hit amongst both researchers and the general public. What was revolutionary was his mathematical definition of a causal cybernetic feedback loop. Feedback loops are everywhere. Imagine your air conditioning unit, the autopilot system of an airplane, or your spinal cord. In the case of an airplane, the system senses its current velocity and pitch. The system then calculates how to maintain a steady flight given this information and adjusts its wing flaps and engine throttle accordingly. The result is a stable flight path maintained by constant feedback from the environment. Professor Wiener provided the math necessary to make countless phenomena more predictable and controllable. This was most obvious to control theorists working in aerospace, like in our autopilot example, but it even helped neuroscientists understand how your motor neurons can stabilize the movement of your arm. By all indicators, the future looked bright. 
and Norbert's gang of four were eager to fully develop cybernetics. However, the gang of researchers felt anxious about how the work may be used. In early, fiercely interdisciplinary cybernetic conferences, famous anthropologists Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson attempted to persuade Wiener and McCulloch to focus on building cybernetic systems for social and economic planning. For Mead and many others, cybernetics was a cross-disciplinary language that could be used to not only describe, but also engineer new and more just systems of governance. Wiener and McCulloch agreed that there are many diseases of society which cybernetics could help explain and address, like cyclic poverty and urban crime. But they instead insisted that there was an insufficient amount of uncorrupted data to drive any insight from. Despite their resistance, these do-gooders, in Norbert's words, were determined to use cybernetics to better steer society across countless domains. Wiener's gang of four viewed themselves as a cybernetic society, charged with protecting and furthering their cherished science. But unfortunately, something happened. The group of four was far less stable than originally thought. Due to a series of misunderstandings and infighting, Wiener became furious, and he completely shunned his three collaborators for the rest of his life. After this great divorce, a global wave of thinkers from the social sciences emerged, separate from the anthropologists that annoyed Wiener previously. Entranced by Norbert's language of stability and control through feedback, they envisioned new models of how, govern, of how to govern all of society. These reformers came from the great powers of both the West and the East, and their use of cybernetic thinking has completely shaped our lives. And now, I want to turn it back to Luke. One notable disciple of cybernetics is MIT's very own Xi'an Xu Sen. He was a brilliant rocket scientist. He's the co-founder of Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was a professor here at MIT, and he worked under multiple US presidents. He also built the first nuclear weapons and rocket systems for the People's Republic of China. Given his profound expertise in American weapons, the federal government put Xu Sen under house arrest for five years until he was allowed to return to China. They were afraid of his knowledge leaking, and they figured that they could just quarantine him until his technical expertise became outdated. But during that house arrest, Xu Sen discovered Norbert Wiener's cybernetics. He was deeply inspired, and he invented the entire subfield of cybernetic engineering, which, less than a decade later, helped him engineer Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward. As he rose through the ranks of the Politburo, he attempted to better steer the new and complex agricultural systems that China had entrusted to feed hundreds of millions of people. And by the 1970s, digital computers improved, and the field of cybernetics matured in turn. Xu Sen and his protégés believed that they had discovered how to avoid the coming apocalypse of overpopulation. They were partially inspired by a report from 1972 titled The Limits to Growth by a group called the Club of Rome, which reported on a computer simulation held here at MIT that modeled human society and the Earth's biosphere as two interdependent dynamical systems. Given the current rates of economic growth as of 1970, the model predicted many possible futures where humanity overpopulates, depletes all of its oil reserves, and witnesses total ecological ruin. This had a massive impact on the thinking of people all over the world. The computer system itself was invented by MIT professor Jay Forrester, another follower of cybernetics. To converge to a stable equilibrium and to achieve balance between the economy and with nature, Forrester and many others recommended a total end to economic growth in general. And concerned by Forrester's prediction, Xu Sen's protege, Song Jian, used more cybernetic computer simulations to resolve China's current predicament. To quote Daniel Levy King in Palladium Magazine, Jian believed he had discovered the feedback mechanisms of the entire population system, its parameters, and how to achieve optimal control. His conclusion, based on a model that took into account studies of natural resources and social equilibrium, was that the target population for China should be 700 million. And the only way to get there within a decade was by restricting all women to a single child. And so, in 1980, China began to roll out its one-child policy, as recommended by the cyberneticists. To steer the world towards stability, the state forced countless women to terminate their excess pregnancies and caused a massive bias towards male births through sex-selective abortion. Secondary effects emerged as well, which the cybernetic model did not account for. Millions of families now had unregistered ghost children. These are people who completely missed out on China's social safety nets. There are many other effects that the Politburo lacked enough cybernetic sensors to understand, and so the full extent of the chaos that was ensuing was not fully perceptible by the state. Norbert's disciples reshaped life in the West here as well. 
Staggering inflation, economic recession, and increasingly powerful computers in the 70s led America to become a pioneer in fully automating its stock exchanges. An American economist by the name of Fisher Black called for replacing all human stock exchange operators with a cybernetic platform instead. These people, instead of being people, it was computers. <laughs> they would handle all stock trading, market making, and underwriting through constant feedback from both computerized traders and from real-time market data. And as cybernetic feedback loops spread throughout the financial world more broadly, the lives of all Americans became increasingly determined by the logic and stability of these cybernetic systems. Loans, credit cards, pension performance, supply chains, and just the general allocation of resources across the planet is now to this day governed by these automatic decision-making systems. And like with Song Jian's one-child policy, the behavior of these systems is highly theoretically stable, and provably so. But in practice, there are many points in which it is too rigid to fully incorporate and react to the risks of our highly chaotic, dynamical world. We've seen examples now of how the cybernetic principles of optimal governance currently surround us, from the collapse of Norbert's Gang of Four, to China's one-child policy, and to the computerization of the entire economy. We've seen clear examples of how to build a cybernetic society. There are two lessons that can be learned. One is that there really is no permanent balance of nature. In the final years of Norbert Wiener's life, he wrote a strange book called God and Gollum, the ways in which cybernetic impinges upon religion. He wrote, the future offers very little hope for those who expect that we will have a new group of mechanical slaves that will offer us a world in which we may rest from thinking. Help us they may, but at the cost of supreme demands upon our honesty and our intelligence. The world of the future will be an ever more demanding struggle against the limitations of our intelligence, not a comfortable hammock in which we can lie down to be waited upon by our robotic servants. As cybernetic technology continues to improve even to this day, the world, as Norbert tells us, will become only more complex, not a less complex place. We cannot be foolish and imagine that a restful, utopian end state will result from competently engineering and combining these various cybernetic systems in our lives. The second idea that Keith and I want you to walk away with is to be wary whenever you are asked to cede your agency to a computer in general. While cybernetic systems have very competently, in many cases, steered so much of our lives, they clearly do strip away some of our own decision making away from us. Sometimes it's for the best, and it leads to a hammock that we can rest upon, and other times, far less so. As new systems promise to steer us towards even more stable pathways in the future, be sure to understand what it is that you are risking. In addition to that, what you should also do is you should watch a movie that my good friend Wesley and I co-directed, titled MIT Regressions. It's a documentary that covers the history of MIT from World War II until the present day, addressing many of the themes very similar to what you just heard. Thank you all. <laughs>